Hi, everybody. It is June 27, 2021 still. Yeah, it is an everyday affair now with the massive destruction that is taking place due to our weather terrorists using technology that an awful lot of people do not understand that man actually has available to man to and don't get all you know in a tizzy if you're a feminist and I'm saying man okay I don't do that political correctness bullshit so leave that please you don't like it don't unsubscribe don't watch my videos that's all I can say but um yeah the technology okay yeah, you know, so many people are using smartphones. They have no clue how it came to be, but they sure do love it. Well, it's a technology. Electromagnetic frequencies allows you to carry around that phone, yeah, you know, so you can speak really loudly in supermarkets and just be as rude as you'd like to be. But don't you think that maybe they're using those electromag uh, electromagnetic frequencies for something else? Maybe? How about that nanotechnology? Hmm, those nano chips in that phone. All right. So, I want to thank Truth and Time for posting this just today. It is a uh, nanobot swarms the ants. Ants ants all over now i also want to show you this video that i posted i mean captured earlier and looking at mexico i was like oh my god well what i showed you uh last night <clears throat> the unbelievable uh well what were you having in mexico thunderstorms hurricane erike it's hurricane erike so you got those storms boy all right you're looking at ants the swarming of nanobots now this was taken at um what time 6 35 just about an hour ago well this has been pretty much what it's looked like all day but i saw this and i thought all right oh this is where this was just 24 hours ago it hasn't moved and i thought massive flooding is going on here well, sure enough, it is. It really is. Look at this. The twinkling, the twinkling nanobots in our atmosphere. And yeah, all they need is a computer, a computer to put in their codes, but look at this thing. Hurricanes do, all right. Um, hurricanes did not develop off the coast of Mexico and now they seem to be. That, that it's just, you know, well. But when I listen to people outside of mainstream media, meteorologists, you know, just people who post videos, they talk as if that's normal a hurricane develops right smack off the coast of Mexico sorry this is not this is a whole new change and I, I love it Noah will be bringing down this site for two days for maintenance look at this now, I didn't even check this spot of Mexico, and I'm sorry I didn't, but um, you know, it, it's just not its just not what it used to be, and people need to start asking questions. And look, I mean, we've got nanobots all over, and they're activating them, and what the hell is growing here in the Gulf? 
of Mexico. Oh, geez. Well, you haven't had enough rain. Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, you know, Alabama. So you should be grateful, huh? I don't think so. This is my recording of... Oh, man. I, it was all day, these little blinking... Okay. I cannot figure out what these could possibly be outside of those ants, the nanotechnology. But, yeah, three quarters of the country filled with them, and the West, well, we don't have an awful lot of even cloud. Nope. We got the heat wave that, let me tell you, it's been hard to deal with today. All of these shimmering, glittering you know, pieces of cloud in our network, in our atmosphere, sorry. Um, it's a network of nanobots. That's what it is. Okay, so... Um, So Truth and Time posted this very short, short video. Uh, you know, thank God people do that <laughs> because I don't. Um, and it is, oh, advances in technology are beginning to bring weather phenomena more completely under our control. Current capabilities such as the VD uh, VAR 4D. Sorry, I don't know what. Why am I doing this? I don't know. VAR computer modeling enabled the establishment design of a cloud system. Small diamond nanoskin balloons allow the measurement measurement and the delivery devices to become elements of the weather system, removing closed loop control response lag time. Nanotechnology allows these balloons to maneuver and network within and from the atmospheric se uh, system. Finally, nanotechnology facilita uh, facilitates the basic functions of measuring and changing critical variables required for weather control operations. I'm sorry for this. I'm, I'm so tired. I'm just, you know, this comes from Air Command and Staff College, Air, University, Operational Defenses Through Weather Control. In 2030? Well, I think they've, they pretty much have it. Yeah, they got it going. This is the abstract, the solution. The weather control problem involves networked miniature balloons feeding and receiving data because they have their own little uh, nano GPS. They can receive data, and they can send data. And how do they do that? Through electromagnetic frequencies. Um, here, uh, a network of diamond-walled balloons, those are the nanobots, enters the area to be changed, and then both measures and affects localized temperature and vapor content. This system effectively shortens, I read that, uh, the control loop. Uh, yeah, the future of nanotechnology. Okay, so thank you, Truth and Time. I will link below. So yeah, Hurricane Eri uh, Enrique. Enrique forms off coast. Heavy rains, forecast. <laughs> Heavy rains. Okay. Pero no deja su jacalito. Ay, no, Dios.
Ese carro y quedó. No mames. Homes, businesses. Okay. Hurricanes did not ever develop right off the coast of Mexico, and, but they have been for the recent couple of years. So, another, hey, that should beg questions in my brain. Croatia. In Croatia, a large hail hit the city of Pizegu following a hurricane. Mahune, krumpir, a ovoj prodaj se, a ono je paprika tam, kao još sam još zino, joj bože, a vidite ovo, vidite ovo, sve. The residents of Pizega, who have not yet recovered from the recent flood, are in despair. Ice balls the size of walnuts damaged roofs, cars, destroyed crops, and brought down trees and electric power poles. Almost destroyed crops. And I believe that that is what that woman was so upset about. And I'm sorry. Um, Croatia. Why did I say Croatia? I don't know. What, is anybody else experiencing their brain just kind of like fading away? Fading into something that well, you don't know until you start speaking and then you realize you don't have it. But Switzerland got hit so friggin' hard. It's unbelievable. It's really, you know, this is what Europe, you know, the European countries look like when they have their massive floods. It's, uh, what? okay. Record high shattered as unprecedented heat wave stifles the Northwest. It's bad, guys. It's bad. 108 Portland, Oregon. Yes, all of your comments. Yeah, it, it's quite true, quite true, you know. So this extreme heat doesn't seem to want to let up for a while. That's unfortunate because uh, we're going to be suffering these temperatures for at least another week. You know, uh, record highs are broken. I don't, I don't go by this, I, you know, because they're so into, you know, the lying, you know, data lying. But, yeah, I'd have to say that mainstream media and these temperatures that we're seeing currently are right on because I keep getting comments from people saying it is this. And, well, I posted the video last night showing that where I live in Montana, it was, or Montana, uh, northwest Montana, or maybe western Montana, not wanting to leave anyone out, um, starting Monday noon until Thursday at 8 p.m. Don't you love those, you know, time periods that they give? 
um, we were going to be getting triple digits. Uh, uh, you know, today it was unbelievably hot. So I guess our heat wave started early here in, well, it was brutal yesterday too. So, um, let me, this is the heat wave map for the 27th. I find it interesting that this area of Montana shows, you know, that it's not part of the heat blast that, well, has a very nice, you know, defined line here. But you can't count on these maps. But look at this heat, all right? I'm sorry, 98 in, in these areas, that's not even, maybe at 1 p.m. it was 98, I don't know. But the temperatures I'm seeing, you know, 108 and 102 and, a, uh, well, this is where I live, this area, and 99. Let me refresh. 99. 100 tomorrow. 14, 104, 104, 102, 95, 94. Uh, I don't think that this is normal for this area of Montana, but excessive, yeah, it is. And you know what? I... I can't be in the sun for longer than like two minutes because it, it does feel like it's just burning your skin. Um, and 99 degrees in South Carolina, I'd be out walking. I'd be out walking. Dripping in sweat and here, I literally just collapsed in the afternoon and just fell asleep for a couple of hours. There's something very, very oppressive about this heat. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just too dry. My eyes, my eyes are really hurting because I think it is hot and dry, but here it is. All right, so it's coming. That heat is coming. And what else? is coming with it. Western drought brings another woe. Voracious grasshoppers. Really? Okay. A punishing drought in the U.S. West is drying up waterways, sparking wildfires. Great. Leaving farmers scrambling for water. Next up, a plague of voracious grasshoppers. Federal agriculture officials are launching what could become their largest grasshopper killing campaign since the 1980s. Drought and grasshoppers go together, and they are cleaning us out. Well, Montana. Yeah, federal plans to spray 2.6 million areas, acres, acres, Carol, okay, of Montana grasslands, threatening pollinators and organic farms. This was sent to me by a subscriber whom I'd like to thank, and it was a couple of days ago, mid-June, with the drift putting at risk organic farms and a national wildlife uh, refuge adjacent to the proposed spray areas. Beneficial insects will be killed off. Federal tribal private land in at least 16 counties of eastern Montana are included in the potential spray areas. 4,000 square miles. Whoa larger than Delaware and Rhode Island combined, with some individual blocks measuring over 100,000 acres. There's a lot of land in Montana. It's a big, big state. I think it's second to Texas, but insecticide drift is expected beyond the spray footprint. Of course it is. Oh, but they have to do these environmental assessments, right? Oh, do you trust these assessments? I don't. Uh, the no, uh, and they have to um, assess for significant impact. Funny how they come back with these incredibly toxic sprays. Uh, oh, no significant impact. 
However, the environmental assessments contained no information regarding the scale of the spray effort, the location of the spray areas, or any analysis of how the project would affect many currently imperiled species present in Montana, such as the monarch, monarch butterfly. Eastern Montana supports between 600 and 900 species of native bees. The western migratory population of the monarch butterfly has declined by 99.9% since the 1980s. Geez, I wonder if maybe there's an environmental cause. No mention of the monarch butterfly or its precipitous decline was made in the environmental assessment. We don't even have clear evidence that sprays are effective at minimizing damage to forage or cost effective for taxpayers. Organic farms affected by chemical drift would risk losing certification farmers would lose the associated income for three years. They also risk disrupting their carefully planned rotations. Pilots are not required to observe any buffers around certified or transi transitioning organic acreage unless the landowner has made a specific request. And how many farmers out there know about this? Oh, maybe they'll see this AP report, but uh, have they sprayed already? They might have. Mid-June. Um, you know, and apparently organic farmers have to submit digital maps of their lands. I don't think many farmers have that at their fingertips. Yes. It is unknown how many organic or transitioning growers are aware of the proposed spray campaign. Montana is third in the nation in USDA organic certified acres and is the nation's largest producer of organic wheat. Do we even have organic wheat? I don't know. Lentils, chickpeas, emmer, and spelt. Okay. Well, uh, restricted use insecticide it kills developing insects. Insects that are necessary. The pollinators. I, I don't think we're a very careful people at all. At all. So there is great worry about this huge spraying operation. Okay, here's the grasshopper map. A lot of grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. The red have the most grasshoppers. All right. Um, California farmers hit by drought, changing planting plans. Now I'm sure you know all about this, but 2,000 acre farm in California, unseated this year due to extreme drought. Farmers, they're hoping for access to enough water, but other articles that I've read throughout the weeks, uh, states are saying, mm, you can only have a quarter, 25% of what you need, actually, but what you have used prior. Federal agencies are saying, mm, no water. For you, I mean, this is the destruction of farming big time, you know, and farmers across California say they expect to receive little water from state and federal agencies, uh, leading to fields barren. A lot of farmers are leaving fields fallow. California, top producer of vegetables, berries, nuts, and dairy products. So... Whatever is coming out of California, it's going to be very expensive. And the yields are not going to be what they were. But of course, you know, I mean, almonds are going to be very expensive. The uh, melons, asparagus, sweet corn, almonds, cherries, 
It's all going to be very expensive. But more people out of work, all right? More people out of work. More people out of work. It's not good. Blackouts loom in California as electricity prices are absolutely exploding at a time when so many people can barely afford putting food on the table. Now, yes, of course, it's going to hit the state's low- and middle-income consumers harder. But, oh, I can't remember what state that subscriber was in talking about how they were preparing for the rolling blackouts. <sighs> Happy birthday, global warming. Ah, oh, yes. The quintessential psychopathic nut job subhuman entity that is disgusting. It's 33 years old. Oh boy, maybe that's why we're seeing a lot of destruction. That number, global warming. Well, that's what I keep hearing. It's global warming. It's global warming. It's global. Okay. Uh, just like everything, all of these agendas, but certainly the pandemic, we're forced to only listen to one guy, Fauci. Just like climate change. Oh, you can't. You're, you're going to be censored from YouTube and Facebook. You genuine scientists renowned around the world. Nobel laureates. Yes, look at my climate change hoax playlist. We're going to take this guy's word over the brilliant scientists who are saying, uh... Let's just step back from this a second, and what did they find out? It's all a crock of shit. Sorry, but I don't have time to go into it. Detroit, okay? No! Oh, what the fuck is he doing? That red thing was the roof of a car. <clears throat> now look at this, okay? Um, the 14 foot clearance, 14 feet. Okay, how, how deep is that water? How deep is that water? It's gotta be at least 10 feet interstate. The police, scuba divers looking for people. Ah. Yeah, they came searching it, but I think they found them right now. Oh, they want us over there? Yeah. You? I think it's just a diamond. Uh huh. I think they found them. You think this is the trucker guy or what? Yeah. That's police, right? I believe it's trucker guy. No, no, but the, the, the guy's in a boat. Huh? The guy's in a... The scuba gear? Uh huh. I, them are the, the police, but I think they found Yes, the police. And if you, ah, I was just listening to this video and I'm like, oh my God. They're talking about pulling the man up, the trucker who died, you know, the, all right. Really? Okay. Okay. I, I was listening to this. This is today. Okay. This is today. Today. This was yesterday, and this is still today. Several people I spoke with say there wasn't water on the freeway when they were driving. Initially, it happened all of a sudden, and this is where they say it came from, not just the sky, but from the embankment. Spaces like this, you can see how the grass is completely flattened. They say water came gushing out with a strong force, slamming into their vehicles. One woman says she wasn't sure she'd make it out alive. It just happened all of a sudden. It wasn't even no water. <laughs> Then, all of a sudden, there was lots of water gushing onto the freeway, according to multiple drivers. And all the water was just coming on the freeway, coming on the freeway. And suddenly, man, it just hit a wall of uh, water here, and um, it was no, no recourse, nothing I could do afterwards. My car started floating. I'm like, oh, my God, 
Nicole was heading home on I-94 near Livernois just after midnight. The big old hole where the water was coming out, it was just coming out real fast. It just seemed like, I don't know, it was unreal. It seemed like I was in a movie. The water levels rose quickly on I-94. When my driver door went open, I'm like, wait a minute. My passenger door went up, I said, oh, Lord Jesus. I got out and jumped in the back, tried to open up my back door. I just got the kick in it. She finally got out of the vehicle and says with the help of drivers nearby, she made it to safety. We was holding each other's hands. Trying, it was like a movie. We was like in a rescue. Like we was like, we weren't about to die out here. Like, serious. Mr. Ronald Foster had to climb out the window of his 04 Mercedes. And when he did, he noticed women in a car nearby needed help, too. So it was three older women. Uh, they couldn't make it up this side. Obviously, they couldn't go over the um, defense line. And so we kind of took shelter under the viaduct. As he assisted the three ladies, all four of them getting to safety, he noticed others trying to help the dozens of other motorists escape the water. There was a, a gentleman out here. He had a canoe, a uh, kayak, and he was paddling and just trying to check for uh, survivors and see if anybody needed help at all. As the sun rose, water levels did too. Rescue boats and divers went beneath the water to search to ensure everyone was able to make it out before their vehicle submerged. Hey, all right. Oh, the water was just gushing out? Okay. Uh, look, doesn't this need to be investigated? I, right now, we're in the exact same spot that I was yesterday, and so I, for a point of reference here, you can see on this overpass here on 94, just a couple blocks from Livernoy, it says 14 feet is the clearance. And based upon that clearance, we're guessing this is about eight or nine feet of water. You can see the trash truck, the Think Green, is still in the same spot that it was yesterday. We still have submerged vehicles here on I-94. Uh, you can see the back of one right there through the trees. So it, not much has changed here since yesterday. And as we look down the road, you can see semi-trucks, vehicles still sitting here in water and I drove uh, many blocks down so right now like I said we're near Livernois I also drove over to 30th Street and shot some video from 30th Street you can take a look at that right now and see I, I, I haven't calculated exactly how far this is but I just I, I guess it seems like about a mile stretch here on 94 is completely underwater many cars still left here now the good news is many areas on side streets and on other free ways are no longer underwater so that's good news for many areas here in Detroit you can take a look at this video that I shot as I was driving on a side street in Detroit I I, I had to drive I uh, pretty carefully and slowly myself and my voter journalist as we went under that underpass you can see there's no more water but there are still abandoned vehicles so you want to be the road have you read that book or seen the movie the Dark War. Okay. Why is that water still there? Huh? Why? Why is the water still there? Steve and Sandra, we have been driving across Metro Detroit all day today. We are now in Dearborn at the Michigan and Schaefer intersection. I'm going to have my photographer Joel zoom out so you can see the magnitude of this damage. You can still see a lot of flooding going on. Several cars still submerged underwater behind me. Many people I talk to say that this damage is unbelievable. Honestly, it's something unexpected. I can't even describe it. Brooklyn Ostrowski is one of the many captivated by the flood damage. Parts of Interstate 94 shut down completely as cars and 18-wheelers left stranded on the highway from the storm. People even standing on the overpass taking a look at the power of Mother Nature. John Mother Nature. It's Mother Nature. I am so sick of this. We have mountains of evidence that it is not Mother Nature. And that's all we hear is it's Mother Nature. Please, please can we get off these lies? You know, listening to this, okay, I can. Yeah. 
Well, Governor Whitmer was interviewed. And what is it? Oh, it's the infrastructure. Oh, Biden, the infrastructure bill. It's the infrastructure needs fixing. No, taxes came from the people, from the residents in Michigan. You were supposed to be upkeeping that infrastructure, and you just didn't. But something else is going on here. I thought it was like just a little random water, you know, when I... Went to the stairs, I couldn't even get down the stairs. Donita Morris recorded this video of the water leaking into her basement early Saturday morning. What she thought was just a leak quickly turned the lower level of her home into a swimming pool. The water had the hot water tank, the furnace, and everything almost covered up. And I had numerous of things in the basement, and I lost all my stuff down there. Morris is like thousands of people across Detroit who are dealing with heavy flooding in their homes and cars Saturday. But her case is a little different. I have a newborn infant in there that just turned two weeks today. The heavy rain swept through Metro Detroit Friday night into Saturday morning, swallowing pretty much everything, including several highways. Our cameras all across the area surveying the damage from Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, and here in Detroit in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood. Several people left their cars stranded on the roads. In southwest Detroit, this man had to save his family inside their car from the flooding. And although the water is mostly gone now, many are nervous about the storms predicted to come in the upcoming days. But until then, Morris is counting her blessings. It's materialistic stuff. It can get replaced. I'm just glad that me and my kids is all right. The streets, uh, the water has drained, but not here. No, this water doesn't appear to have gone down even a little bit. Uh, the good news is, is some of the other freeways that are shut down right now due to flooding, they have seen a lot of progress. Predominantly, the flooding in many of the other freeways are just under overpasses. But as you can see here behind me, uh, this freeway is completely flooded. You can't see the median at all, not even a little bit. You can see the semis. You can just barely see the tops of some of the vehicles peeking up above the water. This is pretty intense and it has been like this for over 24 hours. And when you see all of these semi trucks, you got to think of the millions of dollars. This is just the beginning of the semi trucks. There's many more down this line, the millions of dollars in product that could potentially be wasted as water is likely in the bottom of these trucks as they are taking over the car and the vehicle. Now, right now, I want to point out that we are at a pump station. You heard uh, Jen Shans mention those in her previous story. This is one of those pump stations. It's big cement. It goes deep down. I've gotten a chance uh, about a year and a half ago to go inside one of these pump stations to see how they work. This is one of about a couple dozen pump stations that did not work as designed. I take a look at this map. Uh, we'll roll some video and you're going to see this map for starters. There are about 140 pump stations in Metro Detroit. And according to the map, you can see all of those green dots. Most of the pump stations worked, but there were a couple of dozen that did not due to mechanical failures or the red ones didn't work. Oh, the pump stations just didn't work. What the hell is going on then? Or did they just turn the pump stations off 24 hours and that rain is just, it's just sitting there? Really? Well, take a listen to this report. This is uh, interesting and odd phenomenon. We're just going to pan that way. I want you to see the birds. I don't know if you can hear them, but there is. Can you see that massive flock of birds? They keep dipping down into the water, but there is a big group of them that have just been circling as though this is a lake or river, as though they're looking for fish. And you just got to wonder what is drawing these mass amounts of birds that are hovering over us all morning long. They must smell something in that water that they think they'll be able to feed off of. But it's uh, really, really intense. And you look at how much water there is. Now, we got six inches of rain. That is a lot of rain. And She says here we're going to play another video, but she doesn't play it. And she's talking about how water was literally just the the deluge of water instantly that came in from well drainage pipes it wasn't the six inches of water it was water they were feeding into the interstate 
debris. But there's another issue. We're going to play another video for you. These are cell phone videos that were given to me by people who were trapped on the freeway. They said when they first entered the freeway, all these semi trucks and the, the cars that are underwater, they said that there wasn't standing water on the freeway when they were driving. But then all of a sudden, there was lots of water coming from all directions. And this video that I believe we're rolling now, you can see this water gushing, not only from, I mean, they told me it was just coming from everywhere. It was so chaotic. And you can see within this video that water just gushing and even a photo of it coming from the sides of the embankment. Along these embankments, there are pumps and pump stations. And the job is to remove water from the freeway. Unfortunately, there were about a couple of dozen pumps that failed. And instead of removing water from the freeway, they began dumping the water it began gushing onto the freeway catching a lot of people off guard and there are some semi truck drivers according to messages we're receiving that they don't want to leave their cargo so they've still been sitting in their trucks because they've been unable to get off the freeway and you know it is definitely a mess out here we're going to stay on top of it and all right so 28 pump stations failed failed Okay, um, here's a video of the water gushing. It is water gushing onto the freeway. That water, these are videos from a semi-truck driver who was taking them as he was trapped. Several drivers telling me they were on the road, there wasn't much water, and then all of a sudden water started gushing from everywhere, coming from the embankments on the side. So that really contributed to the water that we're seeing now. And uh, as we come back out here live, and we, you can see the semi-trucks, but we're gonna pan around because I just want to give you, you know, a look here at the overpass to the left, just to give you a little bit of perspective. It's high. Okay, that water is still there. It's not draining away. So what the hell is going on? Or, you know, oh, wow, <laughs> this is a hard time, guys, because, you know, facing what is taking place and people just not really... I don't know, using their brains, it's really hard. Okay, the worst hit areas? Worst hit areas include I-94, I-75, and the Southfield Freeway, a painful flashback to 2014. According to the city of Detroit, many areas have received as much as seven inches of rain since Friday, and systems are improving. MDOT confirms at least 28 pump stations stopped pumping due to various issues or mechanical problems. Among the locations, Taylor, Dearborn Heights, Melvindale, Detroit, and Gross Point. What do we do? I mean, I don't think anyone is really actually prepared for this type of a situation. You do an investigation about why. Why is everything failing? Why is everything failing? But did you see just along here, right here, okay, water in one of the videos, and I thought I had it up and I don't, but the water gushing out. You can see, you know, the, uh, the grass right here, the, the lines that demarcate where the water was gushing into the interstate right here. Okay, this was purposefully done. This was a deliberate hit. I'm sorry that there's no convincing me that this was, oh, well, six inches of rain and voila. And the standing of what, the, you know, wow, this time period could make you really go nuts. There was also a tornado that hit Michigan. Look at this. There is no video. I mean, no audio. Audio. You know. Yeah. Michigan got hit hard. This is in uh, Port... I think it's Port Austin? <sighs> Let me see. Yes, Port... Austin, Urine County, Michigan. Saturday. Okay. Um, here's another spot. Michigan, Lake Odessa. 
I don't mean to leave you out, Indiana. You had two tornadoes, uh, uh, Chicago um, suburb, another tornado. Michigan got hit so friggin' hard. So many people are without homes, without vehicles today. That's right, Michelle. As you can see behind me, the tornado forcing this tree to crash right into the back of this truck. But the homeowner here and down the road, they tell me that they're just thankful that everyone is okay. It was very horrifying. I was laying in the bedroom. I heard okay. it all, seen it all. Ted Thompson lives at the corner of Harwood and Clarksville in Lake Odessa. He says tonight he experienced something he's never been through before. A tornado striking his elderly parents' home, forcing a tree to fall on their truck. Kind of nerve-wracking, you know. You don't know what to expect from Mother Nature, you know. She's got a mind, and when she wants to set it loose, she's going to do what she wants. And she did. She did. And thank you, everybody's all right. It was loud. The house kind of shook, and it was over. Less than 30 seconds. Michael Gutierrez lives not too far from Thompson at Jordan Lake and Bipley Road. Even though the duration of the tornado touching down was short, the damage is severe. And the tree blew back to the east, tipped all the way over and snapped off, and that's when my wife said, head to the basement. All three barns are gone. Uh, a number of the trees have been torn down and uprooted. Um, vehicles are damaged. These two saying at the end of a frightening night, they're grateful that no one got hurt. My biggest thing was to take care of my parents, you know, and that was my main thing. I, their safety before mine. I'm happy to be alive, you know. I don't take anything for granted anymore. Do you see how diseased the trees are? Okay. If you have trees, you know, that look like these trees, um, I suggest if you have the money to remove them from your property, if they're close by your house, do it. Uh, if you have, you know, the, if you are able to park somewhere else, not under a tree that is so diseased uh, with fungal disease because their immune system has been weakened greatly from this disease and it can topple over in any kind of wind but certainly the winds that they are flipping around right now, okay, well, I wouldn't park your car near a tree like this. Um, you know, the reason why, and I think you see it, in military documents, what do they talk about man controlling weather? It's so powerful, even more powerful, more destructive, than a nuclear bomb. And in those military documents, what do they say? And it gives us plausible deniability. I have those documents on my playlist. So, <sighs> all right. Ciao, guys. <laughs>